Hello, everyone. Oh, that's loud. <laughs> uh, so my name is Raji Reddy. Uh, I'm a senior technical program manager in uh, the machine learning org in Alexa. Uh, I lead science initiatives uh, to enable skill developers like yourself uh, to build more engaging skills. Uh, and my topic today is it's all in the data. Uh, and we're going to dive into the machine learning uh, behind Alexa's AI systems. So here's a bunch of new devices we launched uh, this year. Anyone notice an odd one out? Go ahead. Uh, no, they're all released. <laughs> Uh, yes, but it's been announced. Uh, yeah, uh, so it's actually the TAP. Uh, so it was actually released last year. Uh, this year we kind of uh, updated it so you have a, a, a wake word on the device so you can use it in far field. It's my favorite device, is why I threw it on there. It's because, probably because I worked on it uh, for its initial launch at least. Uh, so how many of you have actually built a skill? A decent number uh, of you. How many have like certified the skill? Uh, a few are. Uh, uh, but are folks generally aware of Alexa skills kit? Yeah. All right. Uh, so kind of give a very brief intro about it. Uh, so the Alexa service uh, it provides capabilities or skills that enable customers to interact with Alexa-enabled devices, uh, such as Echo. Uh, in a more intuitive way using voice. Uh, so some of the examples of skills are like the Uber skill, the Twitter skill. Uh, now the Alexa skills kit uh, is a collection of self-service APIs, uh, tools, documentation, and code samples uh, that make it easy for developers uh, to add skills to Alexa. Uh, and that's different from Alexa voice services, uh, which is a way for uh, Alexa the Alexa service to be integrated into other devices. Uh, so they are, uh, so basically external device manufacturers can integrate Alexa into their uh, device. Uh, so in this talk, we are actually going to dive into how data is used to improve the machine learning behind Alexa. And we're gonna focus it on Alexa skills kit and uh, what kind of data you provide and how it impacts skills. Uh, so the main goal is to improve accuracy of skills by providing data. So we're first gonna dive into how data is used within Alexa and then look at how you improve it uh, with the data you provide. Uh, so some of the data you provide is uh, utterances, which are kind of broken down into intents and slots. Uh, they are synonyms and entity resolution that kind of helps uh, improve accuracy. You also are able to provide an invocation name and dialogue management. All right, so let's look on the hood. So this is not exactly the hood, but this is a cool picture of uh, what the new Echo looks like. Uh, but the brains aren't actually here. They're all in the cloud. Uh, so let's see how a user communicates with Alexa. Uh, so when a user talks to Alexa, there's an audio stream sent uh, to the cloud. Uh, Alexa identifies a skill you're trying to talk to and recognizes the intent uh, through ASR and NLU. Uh, Alexa then sends this custom intent to your skill where the skill processes the request and sends a response back. Uh, this is rendered through text-to-speech and any graphical component rendering uh, back to the user. So in this box, uh, Alexa's like a cloud, uh, it's a black box. So we're gonna dive deeper into this black box uh, to understand it better. So let's take an example of Alexa, ask weather info if it is hot in Las Vegas. Uh, so you kind of start off with some audio. Uh, on the Alexa Echo device or the Dot device, uh, there are seven microphones. Uh, they're always ready uh, for the wake word, which is Alexa. Uh, there's some signal processing on it uh, where it beam forms and identifies where the user is uh, so it identifies who said the wake word, and that way it can cancel out any other background noise in the room. It cancels out any media speech, any crosstalk uh, in the background. Uh, once it does that, it also does echo cancellation, uh, which is to remove any noise that the, ec the device itself was creating. Uh, so any text-to-speech from your previous response or any music it's playing. 
Uh, then it detects a wake word. Uh, so that's Alexa, a computer, or Echo. And that's all the on-device processing. Uh, the speech recognition happens in the cloud. So this audio stream, once we're sure that uh, the user said Alexa, or one of the wake words, we pass it onto the cloud, very verify that the user actually said Alexa, so there's a second level verification. And then we do automatic speech recognition, uh, which is a conversion from audio to text. Uh, once we convert the text, we pass it into a natural language understanding system, uh, which converts the text into intents and slots. Uh, the intents and slots are to understand what the user said and any variability in it. So in, in this example, uh, the text would be the words, Alexa asks whether in Fort it's hot in Las Vegas. Uh, the intent would be get weather. Uh, the slot would be the location slot of Las Vegas. This gets sent out to your skill, uh, where you process uh, that value and come up with a response, which gets to text-to-speech, which uh, generates that response. So this example, the weather in Las Vegas is kind of chilly, actually. Uh, so the key area that you get to control by providing data on Alexa skills kit is the automatic speech recognition and natural language understanding. And in the next few slides, we're going to go through uh, how you uh, impact speech recognition and natural language understanding by providing the right data for it. Uh, so you're going to break down most of machine learning into this uh, simpler representation. Uh, so most, for each of the uh, components in the previous slide, there are various machine learning components. Uh, so natural language understanding has its own machine learning component. A ASR has its own components. Uh, Text-to-speech has its own components. But we can simplify it into uh, this simplified slide, where there's a training component where you build models. Uh, it ha takes a lot of input data uh, that's considered as training data. It also takes ground truth, which are the answers. Uh, it's what it's learning from it. And you create a model. And that tends to happen offline. There are some processes that are online as well. Uh, but in live usage, uh, the primary aspect is the inference. So you provide some input to the model. Uh, there's a decoder algorithm that runs with it. And you get some answers out of it. So in skills, the data you provide is utterances, intent slots. We'll describe them in more detail in the next couple of slides. Uh, and there's an invocation name and any dialogue management configuration. An example of an input is Alexa asks Travel Buddy about surfing in Sydney. Uh, so that's a one-shot pattern. And we'll dive into what they are in a bit. Uh, and the outputs would be intents and slots, uh, such as activity info intent. Or, and the slots would be something like activity of surfing, city, uh, slot of Sydney. So let's dive into what utterances are. So an utterance is what a user uh, may say to Alexa. Uh, there are two uh, patterns to consider. Uh, one's a one-shot pattern. Uh, now, this primarily applies to skills. When you're using an Alexa skills kit custom skill, uh, you tend to use a one-shot pattern to specify which skill you want to talk to. So in this case, it is Alexa, which is a wake word, ask, which is a launch pattern. And we have a bunch of launch patterns. They're all documented on the website. So it's ask x, tell x, uh, launch x. Uh, travel buddy is an invocation name. About is a connector word. It's actually optional. Uh, so you could also have asked travel buddy how is surfing in Sydney. That's without a connector word. Uh, but we automatically insert some optional connector words. Um, so that's not what you specify. And then the main piece is the utterance, uh, which is what the user's primary intent is or what they want to tell Alexa. So in a one shot, it would be surfing in Sydney. In the in skill, an in skill example is you say open travel buddy first. You, the skills open and you're in the skill sandbox. Uh, and then you say, is there good surfing in Sydney? Uh, so uh, they're kind of slightly different patterns as to what is, defines the utterance. Uh, but the boundary of what the utterance is kind of important for the next few slides. Uh, and then surfing and Sydney are the slots. So what's an intent? So an intent is a group of utterances that specify what a user wants a skill to do. Um, it could be one utterance when a user is saying it, but the way we train it is we give a bunch of examples of uh, what a user might say uh, for a particular intent. 
Uh, a slots is a variable part uh, of doctrines. It's like a city or an activity. And then there are synonyms. Uh, so synonyms specify variants to a slot value that map to the same canonical form. Uh, so here are a couple examples. Uh, so for surfing, you may decide that surf and boogie boarding uh, mean the same thing, or dive, diving, scuba diving uh, are the same as scuba. Uh, so I kind of saw this slide already, but I'm kind of showing it again because we're going to look at the next few slides uh, with this context. We're going to look at training data, we're going to look at the inference, and the next few slides are going to dig into what kind of problems uh, you may notice while building a skill. Uh, so some of you have already built and certified a skill. You may notice some of these issues uh, for the rest of the next time you uh, work on a skill. Uh, it'll it'll kind of give you some insights and intuition as to how to think about models and how the data is being used, how to process your data. So let's look at intent training. So if you look at the top left, um, that's the kind of data you would provide to train a specific intent. In this case, it is activity info intent. And the data you're providing is a, uh, a variety of utterances like uh, activity in city, activities in city, uh, good activity in city, and so on. Uh, you want to have a bunch of variation. Uh, we estimate probably 20 or 30 different types of examples of this variation. Uh, you want to think about moving your slots to the beginning or the end. So in this example in city, how is this activity? Uh, just think about ways you did not expect that users may actually say the same sentence. So that's the input data you provide for training. Uh, and that makes sure that at the inference time, uh, even if you, we didn't provide an exact sample, we build statistical models and uh, exact match models on the data you provided. So we still try and match uh, what a user actually said. I'm going to look at some of those examples. Uh, so now what happens if you don't provide enough data? Uh, let's take this example of activity in city or for the activity info intent and book activity intent with book activity in city. So they're just one example for each of these intents. Uh, and the user says, is there good surfing in Sydney? This is really ambiguous for the models to know which intent it is. There's only one sample. It's going to try and estimate from that sample which intent it is. And it'll probably get it wrong. So in this example, I kind of showed us book activity intent. Uh, the models may have understood that, hey, if there's a word before activity, it's probably book activity intent. Uh, basically, not providing enough data and enough examples doesn't give the models enough to go by. Uh, if there were enough samples that kind of indicated that uh, book activity intent always had the word book uh, because you had like 20, 30 examples, the models may have learned that. Uh, now, like I specified earlier, uh, the models are statistical models, so they do tend to capture things uh, that you didn't exactly add. Uh, so in this example, there's, is there good surfing in Sydney? Uh, if you look at examples, there isn't an exact match pattern. But there's a good chance it will still actually get it. It will look at the, uh, it will learn from the data that's already provided, and with the statistical model, there's a good chance it will actually get it right. Uh, However, for some reason, if it does not get it right, uh, you can always fix it by just adding that exact example, so adding good as a prefix to activity. Uh, so that's a great way of fixing errors. Uh, another thing to think about is unplanned responses to your skill. So let's take the example of, uh, so if you look at the prompt, uh, what do you want to do next? And the only examples you provide in your skill training data on the top left is activity in city, uh, activities in city, good activity in city. Uh, so there isn't a specification. So if the user said book a trip to Sydney, there isn't an example there that captures it. So there's a high likelihood the skill's going to just assume it means activity info intent because those are the only examples you provide. Uh, so one of the things you want to think about while building uh, your machine uh, learning skill or your Alexa skill is uh, what would a user say to your prompt? And you want to have intents that match all those variations. In this case, you could either handle book a trip to Sydney, uh, but perhaps your skill doesn't handle bookings. So what you can actually do is ha create an intent that you have a generic response for error handling. Uh, so you can say, we don't have this feature yet. We're going to prioritize this feature in the future, uh, something like that.
So in an earlier slide, we talked about uh, connector words. Uh, so uh, we actually don't need to provide connector words in uh, training of a skill. Uh, so in this example, it is activity info intent about activity in city. Uh, we actually automatically generate those connector words. Uh, so the reason uh, you may see in the certification, uh, it kind of discourages you from adding those connector words is you may forget to add uh, the variant without the connector word. Uh, so take the example of in skill here where it's surfing in Sydney. Uh, that was without a connector word. A user would have opened a skill and just said surfing in Sydney. Uh, just due to the risk of you not adding uh, the variant without the connector words, I encourage not to add the connector words since you automatically add them in. Let's look at an interesting example. So this is an example of multiple labels. Um, so here, the user or the developer provides uh, two examples. Uh, so activity in city and activity in Sydney. Now, what do you think happens when there's an inference of uh, surfing in Sydney? Basically, uh, Alexa asks travel buddy about surfing in Sydney. Uh, there are two potential labels here. Uh, it could have either been the city slot or in the Sydney by itself is referred to, like there is no slot label for it, which is a different label. Uh, so the models actually wouldn't know what's the right answer. So it may actually randomly uh, not put in, like it may not mark Sydney as a city slot or it might. This is one of the areas you want to kind of watch out for, basically adding ambiguity into skill models. Um, all right, so here's an example on uh, two prompts. Uh, one is, what activity and city are you interested in? And the other is, is there an activity and city you're interested in? What do you think the difference in responses would be? Do you see a problem with one of them? Yes. Yeah. What do you think is the problem? Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so the responses will be quite different. You want to think about what the prompts are, and users' responses are going to be related to those prompts. Uh, so for what activity in city are you interested in, it could be diving in Seattle. But if you say is something, uh, you're likely to get a yes, no response, or yes appended to your data. Uh, and it doesn't add much value to your response. Uh, so you want to think about your prompts and think about what users would actually say to your prompt. Yeah, so basically this training data wouldn't actually, it may match because they're statistical models and it may still match correctly, but you're just making it more difficult. Uh, if you still wanted it to work uh, with a higher accuracy, you'd add these additional patterns of yes, activity in city, yes, interest in activity in city. But in reality, you just want to avoid that prompt because it doesn't give you any additional information. Uh, and then even looking at the what activity in city are you interested in, uh, you want to think about how your prompt's phrased, because users would respond based on that prompt. So a user may say, interested in activity in city, or interested in activity. Uh, so you really want to think about how your prompts are phrased, and think about when you're building your skill, that you provide real examples that match your prompts. All right. So we're going to go back and describe, uh, so we kind of already went through a very similar slide, uh, but this is going to be critical for the next slide, where I'm going to dive uh, deeper into how uh, we build models based on the skill data. Uh, so like we defined earlier, there's a speech recognition component, which converts speech to text. There's a natural language understanding component that converts text to intents and slots. Uh, and as part of it, it converts, uh, uh, it does entity resolution on your slot values. So in this example of is there good diving in Sydney, it comes up with an intent of uh, activity info intent and fills in slots of activity and city. And then with entity resolution, which is uh, getting to a canonical form, uh, it identifies Cuba and uh, SYD, which is uh, uh, the airport code for Sydney. Then this data goes to the skill, where uh, there's some dialogue management part of Alexa. There's some dialogue management you'd apply within your skill. So between the two, there's some dialogue management based on this data. And 
then you create a response and that text uh, is converted to speech by Alexa. So let's dive deeper into how this data actually gets used. And hopefully the, some of the examples we looked at about the problems they intend kind of start making more sense with this diagram. Uh, so on the ASR side, there are actually uh, two portions. There's the acoustic model, which tries to convert from audio to phonemes. And then there's a language model that converts from uh, phonemes to words. Now, they're not two separate models running independently. They're kind of actually running together. Uh, the language model tries to beamform and uh, uh, create real words. And the acoustic model kind of generates more and more hypothesis of the next phoneme. Uh, so they both together try and control the search space into the real words that the user is going to say. Uh, there's a general language model, and there's a skill-specific language model. The general language model is all the things that users in general say to Alexa. So there are actually many different general language models with the different features uh, Alexa has by default. Uh, there's also a skill-specific language model. So when you create a new skill and add data to it, uh, there is a specific artifact created with it. Also, it, it includes invocation name. That helps improve the accuracy of ASR. So it's kind of important that you have the right data provided in your training data. So the utterance data you provide actually helps improve the a ASR recognition accuracy. It also helps with natural language understanding. Uh, so on the ASR end, it converts it from audio to text. Now on the natural language understanding side, there are again two parts to it. Uh, there, there is a deterministic uh, exact match model. So that's the exact phrases you provided in your training data. Uh, so every utterance you provided, every slot you provided, uh, we almost guarantee that those utterances, if ASR recognized it correctly, that those would be matched by NLU. The only catch is the mismatched labels. The Sydney example we looked at where it was either a slot of Sydney or you just added in the intent. So in those cases where you add too much ambiguity into models, it may not match the right thing. But in all other cases, if you provide the exact example, uh, it should match. Now, the expectation is not that you provide every example that any user would say to your skill. Uh, the idea is you provide the most frequent examples a user may say to your skill to get the best accuracy. For the long tail of potential responses a user may say, there's a statistical model for the slots and intents. So it, it would know that if there's the same pattern being used by uh, the user as your skill model, it'll know where to mark the slot values. It'll know which intent it is. Another piece to it is the entity resolution or slot resolution part. So that's the part that defines. Uh, uh, so it get, the entity resolution gets you to the canonical form. Uh, and we'll look at that in a couple slides. And then the slot resolution uh, applies for some default uh, slots like the date, time, duration, where we have like the Timex format and certain uh, specifications. Uh, so that happens automatically in NLU before you get the data. All right. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, uh, okay, so the question was, uh, do we use any external corpora? Uh, so there's a large amount of data that we have in Alexa, and they are used in the general language model of ASR, uh, and they are parts of NLU that uh, infer from it. Uh, so the main part is, so they're not necessarily external corpora, but there's other data. If you use built-ins, uh, that's the main mechanism with which you use external data. Uh, so you specify which built-in you want to use, and we feed in uh, data from other data we have.
Yeah, so you can always add, so what are data is being used in this? So the question was, can you have additional data? How do you impact a skill-specific language model? Uh, can you add some uncommon words? And the skill-specific model is what are data you define in your skill, uh, so all the utterances intent. So that's where you specify the data. In terms of uncommon words, uh, if you provide exact patterns of how you expect the words to be said, uh, the skill-specific model will have a higher accuracy in recognizing it. Even if we, it's an unusual word where we don't know the pronunciation, we will try and estimate the pronunciation for it and still try to understand it. Now, if it's a really unique word, we may not know the pronunciation right away, uh, and we have online and offline feedback loops where we uh, learn and continuously improve Alexa. So uh, in a future iteration, we may add in that pronunciation. All right, so let's look at uh, slot training. So we talked about uh, how the models are statistical. So taking this example of Alexa, so on the left side, uh, top left side, we have two slots, uh, the activity slot and the city slot. Uh, the activity slot has diving, hiking, and skiing. The city slot uses a built-in of Amazon.us city. Uh, on the inference side, uh, the user says, Alexa, ask travel buddy about surfing in Playa Grande. So surfing isn't in the list of activity slots, and Playa Grande isn't uh, a US city, so it's unlikely to be in that built-in slot. So we may recognize it because it is still, there's still a statistical model behind it, and it may detect the right slot value. Uh, but if it doesn't, you can actually extend the slot values. Uh, so that is basically improving your skill, your custom slot in your skill. And for the city slot, you can extend uh, certain built-ins uh, with additional values. So how do you get good coverage? Uh, so one of the key ways to get good coverage is using built-ins. So we have a large library of built-in slot types. Uh, we are continuously improving them, and they, uh, we add new data to them all the time. So that, that's a great way to get good coverage. Uh, but you can also build custom slots yourself. Uh, and one of the key things I mentioned is you want to have high frequency data in your slot. And in your instance, for like all the data you provide, you want the high frequency what users are actually going to say in, your, in the data you provide. So some of the ways to get the high frequency data are, for example, getting sales figures. Uh, so if you're adding movies, uh, how did in the box office, you may want the top 10,000 or top 5,000 movies based on actual sales. Uh, you may decide to add cities based on census data information, or you may add names based on census data information. Uh, you can also pull data from other applications, uh, like your website, or a cell phone app, or a chatbot, or any other application that you may have that has the right data. Uh, you want to try and find the high frequency data and add that into your skill to get you the best accuracy. And as we discussed, there's ways of fixing uh, any issues with coverage. Uh, by adding an additional value if it's missing from a built-in. Uh, one of the key points I want to mention is uh, you want to be careful about adding uh, low-frequency data into a built-in. Uh, so either you want to bug fix and add an incremental fix to it, or you want to provide the entire data set. Uh, and the reason being that uh, any data you provide in that skill-specific grammar we talked about, a skill-specific language model, uh, it's kind of weighted higher than uh, the existing general language models. So if you uh, provide low frequency examples, it may hurt your skill. I'm going to show you an example here. So let's take the US first name uh, slot type and you add uh, a spelling that is a unique spell spelling to Daniel. Uh, and then you say, send a message to Daniel to the skill with the right spelling you wanted you're more likely to get this misspelled or, well, it's not necessarily misspelled, it's just differently spelled, uh, but it's not the common way of spelling it. Uh, the reason being is because we weight uh, the data you provide higher. Uh, so you kind of want to watch out when you're extending built-ins as to what data you're adding, uh, and you again want to add high frequency data. Uh, if you do have users with unique names and you want to uh, handle that use case, one of the great ways to do it is to have fuzzy matching on your skill side. Uh, so use phonetic fuzzy matching uh, to match the exact uh, personalized catalog you might have for names. 
So let's look at some error handling examples. Um, so let's look at this example where you have an activity slot and a city slot. And the user says, ask Travel Buddy about sharks in San Diego. Uh, sharks is not in your catalog. However, uh, it probably will still get recognized as activity sharks because it showed up in the right uh, position in the utterance. Uh, so one of the ways to handle it is to look at the entity resolution results. Uh, we, so all skills right now get an entity resolution result. You get a ER success match. Uh, and you can look at that to decide whether it's actually in your catalog. Uh, and you can have automatic responses about, hey, we don't handle this uh, particular value. So we talked about mismatched uh, labels on the intent side. Uh, this is an example of mismatch uh, slots um, where you have the same values in multiple slots. So looking at this example, the intent provided is activity in city or water activity in city. And as you can see, between activity and water activity, there are some overlapping slot values. So what do you think happens when someone says, ask travel buddy about surfing in Sydney? The model's going to be confused. It's not going to know which one. You might actually get either one of them. But if you're expecting one result in your skill, uh, you may not get that result. Uh, so you want to keep and watch out for like slot values overlapping in different slots, uh, since it may confuse a slot model. Let's look at some data preprocessing examples. Uh, so we talked a lot about intents and slots. Uh, for a slot, we talked about getting uh, good coverage by pulling data from other sources. Uh, now, one of the issues you might have is the data you provide in your slot may not be in spoken form automatically. Uh, so it, it may not be in a way that our speech recognition system would know how to understand it. Uh, so what uh, we automatically do is convert it into spoken form. In this example, we convert uh, PJ Harvey into the initialism of P dot J dot Harvey. Uh, we convert the camel case example of motor biking. Uh, so if you provide data in the right input format, where it's in a written form and it's kind of clear what the spoken form should be, we would automatically convert it into its spoken form to be used in speech recognition. Uh, one of the issues that may occur is if you say lowercase this data, uh, we would actually lose context and not know what you, how you wanted things to be formatted. Uh, so one of the key things to be thinking about in uh, providing a slot data is uh, either you provide it in the original form and then we will correctly uh, pre-process it. And if it's not working right, you can pre-process it based on these rules. Uh, or you can just reprocess always pre-process yourself. So you always create a variation of spoken forms, and you add it into your synonyms. Uh, so we're going to look at an example of synonyms. Uh, so this is an example of entity resolution now. Uh, so the training data here is uh, an airport slot. Uh, the values are Seattle, Las Vegas, London, Tokyo. Uh, the synonyms are. Uh, the variance that users may actually say. So it could be the spoken forms. Uh, we would automatically generate some spoken forms, uh, but you can also add them in, especially if uh, our automated mechanisms didn't work right for a particular form. So in this example, it would be something like CTAC or SEA. Uh, for Las Vegas, it might be the airport code of LAS. You can also specify an ID, which is like a canonical form. Uh, so in this example, it's the right side of SEA, LAS, LHR. Uh, the reason to provide training data in this format, and this is a relatively new way uh, that we kind of launched uh, uh, sometime in the summer or in June. Uh, the reason you provide in this mechanism is we allow for any of these variants uh, to correctly match a slot value. And we return the canonical form. So that makes your development a lot easier uh, so, so you don't have to do as much fuzzy matching on your end. Uh, we do the fuzzy matching or match the variance you provide uh, on our end. We do do a little bit of fuzzy matching as well uh, for certain token forms uh, automatically. Uh, so on the inference side, uh, if you provide CTAC, you would actually get like the canonical slot value of Seattle uh, and ID of SEA. 
but you also actually get the input form. So if you're providing a prompt response to the user, uh, you can actually use the original input. Uh, so if the user said CTAC, you can respond in the SSML with CTAC in it. So another topic I want to talk about is slot anchor words. Um, this is actually a pretty important uh, issue to uh, be aware of in building NLU models. So take, for example, I want to travel on date, at time, from city to, to city. Uh, they, they're very specific prefix anchor words for each of the slots, which are correct. Uh, and that's kind of how the models learn uh, for the statistical models, which is the right value. So if you change the sentence around, if you provide enough sample training data, it, the statistical models would learn that after on, there's usually a date. Uh, after from, there's usually a from city. So kind of having these correct anchor words uh, helps the models learn uh, the statistical values correctly. Let's show you a bad example of how you can break the system. So if you use a connector slot uh, as part of your uh, utterance, and then you just put in all the variants, on, at, from, in, makes it very easy to build a skill uh, because you know, don't have to think about it. You just added all the variants. You have a bunch of variation in your skill. But it actually makes it very hard for the statistical models to get uh, you know, which word is a date, which one's a time, which one's a from city, which one's a to city. If you had an exact match pattern, it might work out okay because uh, this specification tells it that uh, the first one is probably the date, uh, the next one's probably a time. But if someone mixes it up and says it in a different pattern, uh, it's probably going to fill in the wrong values. Uh, so in this example, uh, it, it would probably accept like book travel to 25th May and uh, fill in uh, two city as 25th May. So to summarize the issues on utterances side, uh, you want to increase coverage of your existing intents and slots based on frequently used data. Uh, adding data that's not frequently used doesn't help as much. Uh, you want to iterate on your prompts to be less ambiguous. Uh, so that the response you get better match what you added in your data. And you also don't want prompts that uh, don't give you the right data back from the user. Uh, you want to update your intents and slots to match responses uh, to prompts. Uh, you want to create new intents and slots for unhandled functionality. So the example of uh, booking uh, an activity. If, uh, even if you don't handle it, you probably want uh, an intent that handles it. Uh, just so you can give a reasonable, graceful response back. Uh, you want to limit generation of unrealistic utterances due to multiple consecutive slots. It actually hurts both the ASR and NLU. Uh, on the ASR end, uh, it thinks that patterns, like, patterns are possible that aren't actually possible. Uh, so you may get more ASR misrecognitions. On the NLU side as well, it may uh, slot fill the wrong uh, slot value uh, if you provide a lot of unrealistic patterns. Uh, you also want to use synonyms and entity resolution uh, to help improve your skill accuracy. Uh, it also helps simplify your skill development cycle uh, because it does a lot of error matching or uh, unhandled values within your slot. So now let's look at invocation names and how to uh, get a good invocation name and what to think about uh, in your invocation names. So a couple key things to think about while picking an invocation name. You want it to be easy to remember. Uh, you want it to relate to your skill. And you want it to be natural for users to say your invocation name uh, with the common inv invocation patterns. Uh, so you want to kind of go through the patterns that we support and see if the invocation name is natural with it. So we have a set of requirements. Uh, for a better experience for users with Alexa. Uh, so this prevents confusion for the users when they're using uh, Alexa skill. Uh, so one, we kind of want it to be non-confusable with uh, common Alexa commands like the built-in weather. So we pr wouldn't let you build a skill uh, with the invocation name, name of weather. Uh, we also prevent you from uh, creating invocation name uh, with a 
a person's name or a place. Uh, we prevent one word invocation names and any workarounds like using the uh, uh, and as to create a two word invocation name. So these are a set of uh, requirements we have to make sure that users have a good experience with Alexa. The second piece is we have a bunch of requirements so that Alexa hears invocation name correctly. Uh, so once we want the invocation name, or actually you want the invocation name to be easily pronounceable uh, and phonetically distinct uh, to avoid being misinterpreted as other similar sounding words. Uh, for example, avoid uh, alveolar sounds. Uh, you want lowercase, you want to specify invocation name in lowercase alphabetic characters because a spoken form ASR recognizes is always uh, lowercase. Uh, so we automatically actually uh, validate an error check for that. Uh, you want to make sure there's space between words. You want to remove any hyphens. Uh, you want to make sure that there's the right possessive apostrophes like Sam's, uh, and you kind of want to make sure it's a, not the curly apostrophe. Uh, so the bunch of uh, very specific requirements to make sure the invocation name is going to be recognized well from the use, uh, by Alexa. Uh, the key to getting the good, a good invocation name is to actually test it. Uh, so try out various invocation patterns once you build a skill. Uh, try out uh, common patterns like open uh, invocation name, launch invocation name, uh, tell invocation name to do uh, X. Uh, also look at your invocation utterances, uh, your, your example utterances you provided uh, for uh, customers who use your skill. Ask others to try it out. Uh, you'll often find that uh, what you thought seemed reasonable for an invocation name is something others don't pronounce well. Uh, Alexa doesn't hear it as well. Uh, so do some beta testing, have a piece of party, bring some friends over, try out your skill. Uh, the key thing you want to look for is if your invocation is natural for users to use and Alexa is recognizing and invoking your skill often. And uh, while you're doing beta testing, uh, if you want to see how Alexa interpreted your invocation name, you can review the history in the Amazon Alexa app uh, basically in the app, you can navigate to the settings and then the history and you can see exactly what Alexa interpreted uh, doctrines as. So there are some insights. Um, so Alexa hears your invocation name more accurately with the supported sample utterances. Now this kind of comes from our previous diagram where I kind of showed there's a skill specific model uh, in, in a language model. Uh, so the data you provided uh, for the skill kind of works better with the invocation name. It doesn't mean it wouldn't work uh, with a new pattern uh, because we'd still uh, have, we still allow the general language model to work and we'd still recognize the invocation name with other words. Uh, but the invocation name works a lot better if the utterance you tried has the, uh, it's an in skill utterance. So in this example, like travel buddy would be heard correctly if surfing in Sydney was in your uh, skill interaction model. Also, Alexa is more likely to misrecognize uh, uncommon words uh, for invocation names. Uh, so don't pick a name that people wouldn't usually say. They're just more patterns that uh, it, it may be misrecognized. Now, uh, we do understand words that uh, are not common uh, because we'll try and estimate uh, what its pronunciation is and we may still get it right. Uh, but there's a higher likelihood we'd get the pronunciation wrong and it'd be harder for users to use your skill. So if you do have invocation issues, what do you do? Uh, you can increase the coverage of sample utterances. Uh, if the reason the invocation name is not being heard correctly is because your sample utterances aren't comprehensive, uh, just increasing that coverage actually will improve your invocation name on this uh, hearing. Um, Consider another invocation name. Uh, if it's reasonable for your particular skill that there's a better invocation name that's better recognized, like consider just going with that. Uh, but if your skill's already at a medium accuracy, you could decide to just publish with it. Uh, because we do have active learning mechanisms once you publish where we improve the accuracy. So if our pronunciations are not correct, we try and add those pronunciations. 
uh, there are automatic mechanisms within our uh, ASR where in future releases it improves uh, how it hears uh, the invocation name and uh, all the data you have in your skill. So now let's talk about dialog management. Uh, so this is a relatively newer feature as well uh, in Alexa Skills Kit. Uh, it helps you improve accuracy of your skill. So the three key features we have for dialog management is uh, a slot filling, slot confirmation, and intent confirmation. Uh, what dialog management is, uh, you basically provide a context to Alexa as to where you are uh, in terms of a state machine, uh, as to whether you're trying to get a confirmation from uh, the user or you're trying to fill a slot. This helps us to build more accurate models. So it simplifies the collection and uh, confirmation of slot values and intents. Uh, it improves accuracy in slot filling because Alexa now has context as to which slot you're trying to fill. Um, and you, yeah, it, it's actually like a no-brainer to use it uh, for your skill. So to summarize uh, this talk, um, so uh, test your experience with real users. You're going to learn a lot uh, about uh, all the issues you have, what is the most frequent data to be added, or what did you miss, how do uh, users respond to your prompts. Uh, I cannot emphasize it enough. Uh, uh, it's a key part of machine learning, uh, kind of trying it out with actual users or actually any development experience. Uh, it, you're always going to be surprised by the responses you get from users which may not match what you expected. Uh, you want to pick an invocation name that users actually remember and Alexa understands well. Uh, that, that is the entry point into your skill. If users can't say your invocation name or can't get in your skill, they can't use your skill. Uh, you want to add more data uh, for your slot values and utterance patterns that customers actually use. Uh, you want to watch out for some data pre-processing issues in your slots data. So if you have uh, punctuations and uh, various uh, casings, uh, you may want to consider either uh, normalizing them yourself uh, to a process form or let Alexa learn and in future releases it will continue to improve. But if you're looking for the fastest improvement, you may want to just pre-process it yourself. Uh, highly recommend using entity resolution for all your slots, uh, especially using synonyms. Uh, we launched it uh, earlier this year. Uh, it, it's a great way of uh, identifying the canonical form and uh, simplifying your uh, skill building experience, uh, as well as fixing issues where we have misrecognitions uh, you can just add a synonym to it. Uh, I highly recommend using the dialog management features for slot filling. And also all this guidance is going to be on the alexa.design uh, slash guide uh, link. Yep. So that's all I have. Uh, I will kind of hang out at the back for any questions you may have. I'm not taking questions on the stadium. Okay. Thank you.